Hello, I'm Richard Vogue's The Bald Explorer. It's Halloween and I thought I'd give you a Halloween story. This from Philip Mercer's book, Tales of Old Sussex, which was published in 1834. I've done a series of videos about some of his stories. I tend to read them, rewrite them and present them uh, because the language is a little old. So excuse me by looking occasionally at my notes because I want to get the story correct. This one is called The Devil's Stone. We all know that uh, in and around Sussex and other parts of the country, there are these strange stones, standing stones, stone circles. Some of them are sandstone, granite stones, or even sarsen stones. And some resemble things, perhaps animals, uh, insects, or other creatures. There was one such in Alfriston in the 18th century, apparently. It appeared on the tie, which is the green near to the church in East Sussex, and just in front of the old priest house, which was, uh, I believe, the first house bought by the National Trust. Who put it there? Nobody really knows. How it got there? Nobody knows. It was a strange stone because it was shaped vertically, and some say it looked like a man. Some even went as far as to say, in certain lights, it looked like the devil, which is how it got its name. Though most people thought of it as the fertility stone, for it was said that should you touch the stone, a simple touch would be enough to secure, if you were a woman, fertility, and that if you made love on the night of the summer solstice, or indeed the winter solstice, you would be guaranteed to conceive. And a casual glance, apparently, at the, uh, the birth registers show that there was an abnormal amount of babies born some nine months later, though whether it was due to the stone or just the fact that people were a little bit more open, shall we say, during those festival times to a little, how's your father, who can tell? It was also said, however, that if you were a woman and you were barren, single, a spinster, and you were to take off all your clothes and embrace the stone for a few minutes, that you would equally become pregnant. But you had to do this on All Hallows' Eve, Halloween. Some said that if you did this, you would be impregnated by the devil. And so most people uh, never did, or any account of them doing this had never been given. And then in 1792, one woman was tempted. Her name was Rachel Harris. She was a spinster. She had never conceived and she lived alone in a small cottage just outside the village where she kept some pigs and some hens. She was of a dubious age, it is said, maybe in her late 50s or 60s, unlikely to conceive at that age. But on All Hallows Eve that year, she did indeed approach the stone strip off and embrace it completely naked. Well, she was spotted by some of the villagers and derided for that. She just spat and cursed them, put on her clothes and disappeared back to her cottage. Whenever she was spotted in the village, people often tittered and smiled and smirked, and some even went so far as to say, have you got the devil in your belly? Though it was curious because as the weeks passed, people noticed that she had changed somewhat, not in any way that you could quite put your finger on it, but she had, she seemed more erect, more sprightly. She no longer scowled or walked with uh, a, a slow pace. She seemed more positive 
and what surprised most people of all, she smiled a lot. It was also noted that her grey tangled hair had taken on a, a more light brown colour and had a, a strange luster in it. By Christmas that year, even the bachelor folk were spotted talking to this woman in a, an animated way. They seemed to be trying to impress her, but she was having none of that and repelled them, keeping herself pretty much to herself. Yet a lot of gossip went round the village that she seemed so much more younger than she'd ever appeared and a lot happier. By January of the following year, the gossip rumour increased. It was thought that somebody in the village had been seeing her regularly. Although no, nothing had been spotted, no one had been spotted with her, it was assumed that she had made the acquaintance of somebody, for when she came out into the village, which she did frequently, although she kept herself, as I've said before, to herself, it was plainly visible that she had a bump. Somebody had impregnated her. But who? People were questioned, men folk, married or single, but they all denied it. Nobody seemed to have known her, not in the biblical way. But by April, Rachel Harris was spotted struggling somewhat, for the bump had grown. She was slower and walking with some difficulty to the village. She would rest frequently on a park bench. But she still had her good looks. In fact, the looks had improved. She seemed so much more radiant and her hair almost blonde. Some said that she appeared 20 years younger. And then there were doubts. Was this the same woman at all? Perhaps this wasn't Rachel Harris, but her daughter, though no one had ever known or even suspected that she'd had a daughter. But it was curious just how young and youthful she looked, despite her large belly. By June, however, Rachel was rarely spotted at all, and when she was, she laboured under this huge belly. It was thought to have been much bigger than you would have expected at that point, and she would rest for some time, not talking to a soul, keeping her head hung low and avoiding eye contact. She wasn't seen at all in July. And some women folk had taken pity on her, thinking that she could no longer get out of her cottage at all, that she could barely walk. And when they had seen her earlier in the month before, she appeared to have been in a lot of pain. So some of them went to visit her. They took her food and they offered to wash her stomach and keep her house clean. But by August, they refused to go. Rachel's personality had changed. She had a short temper. She even spat at those who had come to help her. She cursed and swore at them. And those of a curious mind who stealthily crept up to the house and peered through the window found themselves recoiling quickly from the stench of the place. It was very curious now that she was still with child it had not been born, and the nine months had been and gone. A doctor learning of the case came to see her in September, 11 months after the time she had embraced the stone in the village. He brought with him two assistants. At first, they weren't admitted to the cottage, but after some negotiations, Rachel let them enter, and they came into the single room where she was stripped, pinned to the bed. This huge belly holding her down, her clothes had been ripped and the white skin of her belly exposed. The doctor recoiled almost immediately. There was something unnerving about her and he left, leaving his doctor's bag on the floor. 
The two assistants stayed a few moments later, but also recoiled, shocked, and they retired to the pub to have something to eat and drink to smooth their shaken nerves. People were curious about what they had seen and why they were reacting in such a way. And they admitted that as they stood there, looking at this stretched skin, they could see it undulating and moving. It was most unnatural, but it was the size that got them most, the size of a small cow. And then it seemed that a strange bony-like hand had been pressed against the inside of the belly, clearly seen through the skin. It recoiled, and then later a face pressed up against it, a strange skull-like face. And at that point, the skin seemed translucent, almost as if the skull could see through the skin straight at the doctor's assistance. That was when they hastily retreated from there. Many wanted to go and see this for themselves, but they were too frightened. They couldn't bring themselves to approach the cottage. And for some time, Rachel Harris was left alone. Then October came. And one morning early in October, the third or the fourth, there was consternation. For the big stone, the fertility stone that had stood there for as long as anyone could remember, had vanished, had gone. Now, this was a large stone. It was too big for anyone to steal without anyone noticing, to get it onto some horse and cart and have it away. And yet it was not there to be seen at all. The rest of October was pretty quiet, but there approached the night of All Hallows. And the normal festivities and activities that people would celebrate and, and have a little bit of jocular fun seemed very muted. No one this year was that interested in celebrating Halloween. Few people ventured out. The pubs were pretty much empty. At the stroke of 11, the church bells rang out. And the moment that they stopped and silence came over the village once more, a distant wail was heard, a strange moaning sound. And then it turned into a scream. People started to look out of their windows. They tried to look into the Stygian darkness to see where it came from, but no one could quite work it out. The scream continued. More screams, more wails, more moans. People started to take torches, light them and go out. They got their lanterns and they set out to see what this was. The sound came from the tie, the green, near the priest house. Villagers came forward, peering into the darkness, shining their torches. And there, on the same spot that the large devil stone had once stood that was no longer there, pinned to the ground by this huge disgorged belly, lay the naked form of Rachel Harris. And she was writhing in obvious agony, screaming, and shouting and cursing. And the villagers gathered around her some distance, but no one actually went to her, for they were frightened. There was something grotesque about the whole situation. This belly, this undulating belly, as she screamed on and on, it was horrible. Mothers hid their children under their shawls, and yet nobody left. They were so fascinated by this mysterious and unusual sight. It went on for an hour, and then the strike of midnight, the first of the 12 chimes rang out from the church, which was only a, a few yards from them. It was at that moment that Rachel let out one enormous final scream. Her head went back and her body seemed totally lifeless. 
a second chime rang out, and as it did so, the belly split open, bursting in a shower of water, and the villagers involuntarily stepped backwards in shock and horror. And when they looked again on the next chime, there, crouching on her pelvis, stood this blackened creature. It was on its haunches, and as some describe later, it looked like a shaved goat, yet the torso was man-like, and its head grotesquely ugly. It raised its head and peered into the crowd, causing them to shrink further back. The next chime disturbed the silence once more and the creature stood to its full height, roughly that of a small child of ten years or more. And with it, it sprang. There were shrieks and screams, and the villagers quickly dispersed. Some were trying to find where this creature had gone, but they couldn't see it, for at that moment a cloud covered the moon, and the creature vanished into the Stygian darkness somewhere. It was never seen again. Rachel Harris' dead body was buried near her cottage, away from the church for fear of contaminating the soil. A strange tale, you may think, that has no rhyme or reason. What did it mean? What was it about? Those that witnessed it would not talk about it. No one spoke of this. There were rumours, but they were hushed up. It was as if it had never happened. And life returned to normal. And then in April the following year, as the spring started to lighten everything and the days got longer, a traveller arrived in Alfriston. He was taking in the church and the priest house and looking around as one does in a strange place and he went past a picture gallery and suddenly his eyes were riveted to something. He went in and he purchased a picture. He seemed very excited by this and to take his lunch he went to the pub and he slammed the picture onto the bar. People peered at the picture forgetting that it would be on display in the gallery. A sketch it was of the Devil's Stone the traveller asked the landlord about it. Where was it? Where did it come from? The landlord eyed him suspiciously. What do you want to know about that for? He said. The traveller replied, But this is such a coincidence, for in my village, Barnes Green, near Horsham, we have such a stone. It appeared a few months ago. Nobody knew from where it came or how it got there. One minute there was nothing there, and the following day, there it was. Some of the women have called it the fertility stone. But to me, it resembles a man. Well, more than a man. In fact, I would go so far to say it resembles the devil. Don't you think? Well, that is the story of the devil's stone. Make of it what you will. I hope you enjoyed it. It was one that was told to Philip Mercer some time ago when, as a curate, he, travelling around the country, collected such stories. Whether it's true or not, I have no idea. But it's good fun for Halloween. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to follow, like and subscribe. Give me a thumbs up if you've enjoyed it. And at some time I'll do some more of Philip Mercer's fantastic tales of old Sussex. Until then, thanks for watching. Bye-bye.